Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Goofy Groceries, released in 1941. It's the 321st in the series and it's directed by Bob Tampet. You can find this on the Looney Tunes Golden Collection Volume 3 DVD set. There's no HD version out there, although I did upscale my SD copy to try and approximate a high definition look, but hopefully we'll get the official release at some point. In case you haven't seen this one, I can't show you the full thing here due to copyright on YouTube, as this one's under copyright, but essentially it's like a good old fashioned Merry Melodies where we are in a store, things come to life, and we see a bunch of gags, we then see a quote unquote villain, and we get a big battle at the end. So. Nothing too deep in this one, it's just your pretty straightforward Merry Melodies type short. So what you're going to see first is a re-edit of the original commentary I did with my good friends Blue Genesai who helped re-edit this, and my good friend Steph Stilly. And straight after that you'll hear from my good friend Eli Copperman who gives his thoughts on this short which comes from the Bob Clampett Retrospective Part 1 video. After that I'm going to go through the short into a bit more depth as there was quite a bit that I missed the first time round. So it'll be good to go through all of that and let you know what some of these references are. So without further ado, grab some popcorn and enjoy. And with me today are my good friends, Steph Silly and Blue Genocide. Say hi. Howdy. Grocery store in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, this is the first uh, Bob Clampett uh, color cartoon. Yeah, he'd been doing Porky Pigs up in this till this time and I'm sure he's now excited to do other things for once and it's the first of only two he would do with his original unit before taking over Tex Avery's unit later on uh the cows I believe according to my information from um Austin Kelly the cows sing the song if I could be with you um is that right Steph did I get that one right or yeah did... oh so full of dad jokes this is <laughs> so many big top popcorn. I mean, come on. Now, look at the animation of this dog, how it's like semi realistic and then it just turns really cartoonish. That must be See, some of these. Carey. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, according to yeah, Austin, the John Kerry um, says that. Uh, so, sorry, Austin Kelly said John Kerry did the crooning cow over the beginning and all the scenes of the carnival bark of dog yeah so there you go you were right you give yourself a gold star no. <laughs> i'll tell you in a few moments so what, what is this you know biscuits um there was an old brand i think it was called do you uh need a biscuit or you want a biscuit something like that i think it, it was like an old nabisco like cracker yeah neither of mine there's in, the, in, the, in the planner is anyway. peanut guy on the sink there the tongue sandwiches, yeah. you know, a gag that, that comes all the way from Buddy's Beer Garden. I noticed something with this one. This one feels very much like a 1930s Merry Melodies short where for the they'll have a theme, they'll do all sorts of random gags associated with the theme, and then they'll introduce a villain in the last act, and then there'll be a hero, and the hero defeats the villain. I look at the background, that like the dancing cigarette, just one solo cigarette. I, I noticed that before, just dancing <laughs> on its own. Clearly got no friends. Yeah. See, I'm trying to think if uh, King Kong was re-released any time recently as of this cartoon's release in 1941. I can't think of one. Hero, I guess? Riding the horse radish. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. I mean, look, 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 look at these gingerbread men, like, how they animate. Like, like, there's no outline. That's pretty interesting. It's just colored yeah, blobs in, in a sense. Navy beans. Why not? Why not? Turtle soup. Really? I mean, do people still what? have? What? They what, what is sell this? that in cans. <laughs> Can't say he wasn't creative. I don't know where you'd buy fireworks in a grocery store. But... <laughs> Look at Jack Jack Bunny's uh, face. Just incredible. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Gee, I wonder who re who's referencing, like, what reference yeah, this I've, is. Mm. Hey, it's Batman. No yeah. It's Batman, yeah, clearly. <laughs> that wiggly gum is going to be the thumbnail, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I've got a better thumbnail, and I'll, I'll tell you that in a, in a few moments. Um, and no, this is not the, the thumbnail, uh, Blue. <laughs> 
no, here is going to be the thumbnail. You know, the can cans do it. Oh. Singing, you know, I'm just wild about how. You know, I mean, come on, this has got to be was... the. Oh, right there. The butt That's going to be the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the butt, the butt shot. Yeah. I remember watching this cartoon when I was younger and just immediately thinking, "Who made this?" Because this. This doesn't feel like anything any of the other directors would have done. And then I found out it was, it was Bob Clampett. I was like, makes a lot of sense. Because, I mean, you, you could argue that maybe Tex could, could, could have done this, especially because he was still at, at the studio at, at that point. But what's funny is, it, it's funny that, that, that they mentioned this being in color. I don't think a lot of people know this, but according to, to research, I believe production manager, whatever his role was um, at the Termite to Terror studio where, where the Looney Tunes were being made. Not that the Merry Melodies, but the Looney Tunes. Ray Katz, I, I don't know what happened specifically, but but it was all along the lines of some management change up from him. And the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies were finally able to, to change and not all. So the, the, the Looney Tunes wouldn't all just have to be Porky Big cartoons. And that's also why Tex Avery's first Looney Tunes cartoon, The Wild of the Haunted Mouse, is actually the first one-shot Looney Tune cartoon. And Goofy Groceries is like, finally, like, this is probably what, what, what Clampett was begging for for so long, his very first one-shot cartoon. And I feel like but by that point, he and his crew were just going all out. They are just like, let's have so much fun with this. I feel like all through throughout the, the cartoon that they're just, there's so many like fast-paced gags, so, so many, many good food puns, so many, like a lot of very wonderful John Kerry and Izzy Ellis animation throughout. And the ending, okay, well, the ending is, you know, outdated. Not not that that, that part, but just the, the, the payoff of the, the villainous gorilla just cracks me in the up. And especially, they, they, they beat the Fleischers to it, but <laughs> that Superman gag is just like, wow. It caught me off guard, you know? So those were the original thoughts, and of course, my good friend Eli makes a great point in regards to Clampett really wanting to do something else. Before I get into that, though, just a few bits of reuse animation, which I was surprised. You'd think, hey, he's been given the chance to do a high-budgeted Merry Melodies type short, and yet he still has animation reused. But whatever, maybe... We're still figuring things out. Who knows? But we've got the animation of Jack Bunny introducing himself. That comes from Slap Pappy. Pappy. That buy a waterfall sequence. There is a bit that comes from the rather obscure short, actually, called How Do I Know It's Sunday. We get a redrawn bit. So instead of Porky, it's redrawn as Jack Bunny. We get animation from Chicken Jitters in regards to the axe. And that whole Ned Sparks fish, and I'll go through Ned Sparks in a moment, but that comes from Fresh Fish by Tex Avery. Again, I don't know why he had to resort to using animation. Maybe this one, because of how long the short is, it's only nine minutes. Maybe he went over budget a little bit, or maybe he was focusing on certain parts of it. I don't know, but definitely there was reused animation here. So as mentioned in the original track, yeah, First Color Short by Bob Clampett, and first of only two that he would do with his original unit, because later on he will take over Tex Avery's unit once Tex Avery leaves the studio, and then he does color cartoons exclusively there. It's interesting because at this point, and as Eli briefly mentioned, there was a bit of a change up, because originally up until this point, you had the black and white unit, which were doing just Porky Pig shorts, which was Clampett's domain, and then the other directors were doing the color cartoons with the Melody series. Now you're going to see not just Clampett doing Merry Melodies, but you'll see Tex Avery doing a black and white short, and even a Porky short as well as his Merry Melody shorts, and Fritz Freeling as well, Chuck Jones too. They all do a mixture of the black and white Porkies and even one shots, because now Looney Tunes becomes not just Porky, but it's also other characters but the Merry Mallards as well. I'm guessing this was a way just to avoid burnout, especially for Clampett, who, yeah, by this point must have been really sick of doing exclusively Porkies and stifling his creativity. Can you blame him? But it's interesting that his first choice to direct something different is him going way back. And as I mentioned in the commentary, this definitely feels like an early Merry Melody short, one of those things coming to life shorts. And we had a few of those in the Harmonizing Studio. And then we had some done by Frizz Freeling once he did the Merry Melody shorts. And 
Clamp at the time was actually animating for Freely as well, so maybe it was just a thing that he enjoyed doing and wanted to do his own take. But the structure is very much the same. We start off with gags, then we get a villain of some sort, and then we get a battle, and that's pretty much it. So maybe he just wanted to focus on the gags and just do something he was familiar with. I don't know. But Clamper would revisit the same idea twice further. So he would do a coy decoy very soon with Daffy Duck, and that's actually books coming to life as opposed to the grocery store products in this short. And then he would do his most famous one, which is Book Review, and arguably it's his best, and I happen to agree, it's a definite masterpiece. So all these references now I'm going to go through because you don't even have to know this stuff to enjoy the short, of course, but it's interesting to see just what was considered to be the peak pop culture references of the day versus today, where people are like, who's Brenda and Cabina? Who are they? So they were characters in the Pepsi Den show starring Bob Hope. But there was a radio comedy show and that also starred Jerry Colonna. And that was actually one of the most listened shows during World War II. And for those outside the US, including myself, obviously, Pepsi Dent is a brand of toothpaste. We don't have that brand here in Australia. And I love the animation of those two cows in that bit as well. The whole, look, a man, that... It's really good, and yeah, it's not exa as exaggerated as what Clap would end up doing when he takes over the Tex Avery unit, but still, you can see signs of what's to come. What's also interesting is that, yeah, you got the Brenda Cabina references, but the Cabina cow appears to be an impersonation of Alvia Allman, and the Brenda cow appears to be a Blanche Stewart impersonation. I don't know, it's a bit weird, and there, of course, further radio references there for you so it's a really weird obscure hodgepodge reference in that one little scene there but who cares it's funny the <laughs> animation and voices are great in that in any case <clears throat> another reference i missed last time billy posey's Aqu aquacade and that's a play on billy rose's aquacade and that was a music dance and swimming show and it ran for a few years but most notably, it was one of the most successful productions during the 1939 New York World's Fair. So it was like a big production number and must have been something that Clamp had enjoyed because, yeah, here it is. So we hear Jack Bunny yell out, Buck Bunny rides again. And that is a reference to the Jack Benny movie that came out in 1940 called Buck Benny Rides Again. And later on, there'll be a Bugs Bunny short saying Bugs Bunny rides again. Yeah. <laughs> it's a interesting little reference there. Bunny rides again! But this short is so full of different groceries that are parodies that it'll take me forever to go through a lot of them and half of them I probably wouldn't even know. So in the comments below, if I've missed any references to any grocery item, definitely let me know because it'd be interesting to try and compile exactly what a lot of this stuff is because some of it might have been only obscure not even just to those of us outside the u.s but also certain things might be specific to certain parts of the u.s so it might be obscure to people in other states too so it'd be an interesting thing to go through so we've got the condensed milk which i believe is nestle i can't seem to find any references to that and i believe it could be carnation milk i'm not sure but what i do believe is the case is the whole Fuller Bull Tobacco, which eh, it's funny on its own, right? But I believe that's a reference to Bull Durham smoking tobacco. Bull, yeah. Okay, sure. Why not? Why not? So I mentioned before in the repeated animation, Ned Sparks, that's a reference to the actor where he's been parodied quite a few times. And by this point, his style was pretty much faded. People would have known who he was, but he's not wasn't exactly like a huge name, like say Clark Abel or whatever. But he always had that stern expression and he had that monotone delivery. So, yeah, they seem to be getting a lot of mileage out of his unique look. Let me put it that way. Of course, one of the stupidest jokes in this one is a chicken pie. I love it. It's stupid, but I love it. I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. Now, the mop turns into what looks like to be Leopold Sikowski, who famously didn't use a baton when conducting. But it's interesting that it starts off with the baton, but then the baton disappears. So it's an interesting little look there. It was almost as though they remembered, hey, he actually doesn't use a baton. So there you go. 
Big Top Popcorn. I was looking at it and it appears to have been a real brand, but I can't seem to find anything specific to it. So if more about it, let me know. And of course, we get the beautiful Blink and You Miss It cigarette gag during all of that where they're promoting the circus there. Arguably the most cleverest gag in this short has to be that whole thing with the Barker dog. So you got the Barker dog food. And for some reason, in the background, Barker cat food. Okay. Again, if you know what brand this is referencing to, let me know. But of course, the dog becomes a carnival barker. And for those who don't know, the whole occupation is just someone to promote the circus or entertainment venue as a gallery and come and see this and that and whatever attractions that they have at this particular place. And I'd love the animation of when he s- tries to sell the jiggles. As mentioned in the track, that's a John Kerry, and it, it does pretty good work there, I have to say. Now, Wiggly Gum. Yeah, which, okay, fine. I roll. I get it. I get it. But that's a parody of Wrigley's Chewing Gum, which actually exists here as well. And the name Little Egypt would have been used by many different belly dancers and all that. So it's not really surprising that they would use that name here. So we see the swimming pool later on when they're doing the whole by a waterfall number. And we see the peanut character, but they're basically all just parodies of the various different logos at the time of various products, some of which are still used today. And yeah, we got the tomato can-cans. So yeah, yeah, you gotta love that. Gotta love that. Uh, again, it's one of my favorite jokes. Along with the tongue sandwiches. Yay, I <laughs> love that as well. Now, later on, we see the animal crackers, which weirdly enough, like why is it on such a high up shelf like that? I don't know, but... I never even knew about animal crackers where I am. Maybe they existed, I don't know, but I hadn't seen them when I was growing up. So for those who don't know, who are outside of the US like I am, they're basically just uh, biscuits that are in the shape of animals. And for some reason, they've got a full-grown gorilla in this particular container. So maybe that's why they put high up, because they knew what was actually in there. So once the gorilla is to take a look at everything. I like that little montage of him looking at it. It's like Clamp is being a bit cinematic in that particular part, especially when the gorilla starts going down and the lights go out. But my favorite part of that gag has to be the one pair of eyeballs that you know, had. I believe that's Mel Blank doing that yell. So help. Now we see a small gag involving measles. So just to put in perspective, and yes, I realize the time of this recording, we just got out of a, a pandemic. I get it, I know, but... I have to point out with the whole measles thing back then, at this point, there were no vaccines for measles. So the only effective way to deal with the spread was the whole quarantine. And that's why you see a lot of cartoons utilizing that gag. You'll see a big sign saying quarantine measles because, yeah, there was no protection against the virus at that point. And, yeah, we've already pointed out in the commentary ridiculous things like the whole Navy Beans thing, which I guess that's runner up for one of the stupidest gags here. But anyway, and... The reason we were all laughing at the whole turtle thing, as Blue said, it was definitely unexpected. So, yeah, it was chef's kiss to clap it on that one. And we see the whole war sequence. And what's interesting is that the US hadn't entered World War II yet. So this was interesting foreshadowing for the sort of shorts that would end up happening in not just Warner Brothers, but in animation studios full stop. Now we see, of course, Superman, which we joked, yes, in the commentary. No, it's not Batman. It's... Yeah, Superman, of course. And this short was released on the 29th of March, 1941. And the first Fleischer short was released on the 26th of September, 1941. So this may be the first appearance of Superman in an animated show. Of course, it's a parody. So whether it counts or not, I don't know. But it's clearly a reference to Superman, who by this point had only been in the comics and in 1940 was on a radio show. So, yeah, just interesting to clap and beat the flash to the punch. <laughs> How about that? That whole Henry sequence at the end, which is a nice little punchline, that's based off of the popular radio series, The Aldridge Family, which will be spoofed many times. And it would even be spoofed in Clampett's later book review as well, the whole Henry VIII. So, yeah, that's where that comes from. And lastly, as we finish up the actual short, we hear the whole, oh no, tattletale grey. First of all, Jack Bunny turns into a Rochester caricature. Rochester was a character on the Jack Benny program, so that gag made sense in that regard. The tattletale grey is a play off of the 
Feds napped the soap company's ad campaign where it was all like, oh no, Tattletale Grey. And that was the gag that Clampett reused from shorts like Cheapers Creepers. Whew. So there you go. And I probably missed a few things in the background. So if I missed anything, let me know. This one's just full of references. As for the show itself, look, I'm entertained. It's quite clearly just another Mary Melodies type short, just redone in a more fresher style for Clamper to stretch his legs after being corked for so long. Look, this one gets 7 out of 10 for me. It's not a go too short. It's funny. It's fine. And some of the references, whether obscure or not, are pretty interesting to know. I quite enjoy this one. But that'll do it for this one. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, take care. Thank you.